Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Would you welcome to the stage the director and the apocalypse, John McPhail. So, John, uh, first question. Was there ever a time during the making of your zombie Christmas musical comedy horror coming of age story that you thought, there's a bit too much going on here? <laughs> Never. Um, it, was, it was like one of these ones. So, my first film was a romantic comedy about a guy stuck in a care home. Um, so like I've never done action sequences, I've never done horror before, I've never done musicals, so it was um, it was a little bit of a, a daunting task and you know, trying to sort of figure out how you sort of balance all of that and you know, um, you know, take be truthful to the story and you know make sure that um, it was it was gonna work. Um, so I thought like, what I decided to do was to try and you know, break up the, the three act structure. So the first act is that Zany Teen comedy, you know, let's stay away from the zombies, only tease slightly with them. You know, make sure that, that you guys get to know these characters and get to kind of like fall in love with them and sort of like them and, and know their journey and what they want in their life so that when it gets to that last stage of the film, you kind of care. <laughs> um, uh, so that then the second act would become this sort of horror comedy that's got a a little bit of a dip in the middle where it kind of comes out of nowhere, there's a little bit of drama and just rise back up again so that when I got to that like third act it could become that out and out horror so, and, and hope that you would care for them and you would like them and you would want to see them survive to the end and you don't hate them. There's so many horror films that I watch and I'm like, please die, please. <laughs> You're like, yes, get in there Michael. Um, so yeah, so it was, it was all that kind of balancing act. Um, was, was something I was really, I always wanted to be very careful about. And uh, comedy and horror go really well together, but they're also quite hard to pull off in some ways, because it's quite easy to kind of mess up one or the other. And the, what did you look at in terms of the inspiration for trying to get that, that tone right? I, I totally, like, I mean, we've been uh, compared to, like, uh, Shaun of the Dead a few times, and that is, like, one of the sort of, like, British horror comedies, you know, like, it's been made in... The last 20 years, I just adore, I love Edgar Wright, and I think the way he does is wonderful. Um, and it was just a case of like, it's making sure that, that like, I'm a horror fan out and out, right? Like, that's, that's my genre. And one of the things about going into this film was I was terrified I was going to let people down, you know, like, you know, because I've been doing comedy for so long, and it was a case of being like, right, you know, you know let's treat everything um, with as much respect as possible, you know, making sure that when we got to horror moments that they were there, and they were there as, out, like actual horror moments and everything before that was fun and gore and silliness and as I said there was still some peril and that all came from character you know the characters were, were um, had to be right and as I said we had to have all those little character moments throughout it so that you would care about them and it wasn't just oh it's a silly you know zombie film you know as I said that the character stories all sort of drove through there and that they all had their own little arcs, they all have their own mini arcs throughout the film, and, the, and those arcs are completed, and, and the hope that you would care for them, and not just like it's just silly. Obviously with a piece like this, which is such a kind of cross-genre thing, there, there aren't too many predecessors for it. I saw an interview you talked about the happiness of the Katakuris. There they go! No one ever cares about this! I'm like, Max, come on! It's like, it's unbelievable! <laughs> Which, which is probably one of the only other horror zombie musicals that in existence. So is that, I saw you about you like trying to force some other people to watch and say, no, this is it. Is it is that you've seen Happiness of the Kakataris with Takeshi Miki? Yes, there's a couple of these. This is that. This is my audience. <laughs> um, so um, I, there was a, a film called The Happiness of the Kakataris by Takeshi, Takeshi Miki, and he's. It's, it's really mental. Uh, if you see any Takeshi Miki's films, you'll know they're all mental, but this one's really mental. And I tried to get everybody on the crew to watch it. Like, um, um, there was like the papers that got wind and they were like, oh, there's a zombie musical happening, the first ever zombie musical. And I was going around the production office going, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> like, you need to watch Takeshi Miki and his happiness to the Kakatauris, and no one watched it. No. I'm like, it's on Blu-ray? It's on Blu-ray? And they're like, no, 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 no. The only person that watched it was my graphics guy because he had to put a poster in the background somewhere. <laughs> so what were your zombie rules? You, you're a horror fan, so what were your zombie rules going into this? Was it just classic Romero? Was that what you were you thinking? Or? I totally mean, like, so no singing and dancing zombies was the first rule. That was always the rule. Always a good rule. We're not thriller. Um, um, and 
I, I mean, I wanted to have fun, you know, like at the same time, we're not, uh, we shot this in 28 days, it's not 28 days later. Um, and, uh, you know, there was no, we couldn't afford to have like running zombies, so, you know, we had to work about the pace with it. But what was great is that I'm a massive, massive zombie fan, and in fact, I was shooting my first feature film, and me and my, my lead actor were out of out, out my back, we were having a cigarette, and there was this fog that was rolling in, and it was really cool, it was like, you actually see it coming in. And I went, oh, how cool would it be, you know, to do like a, a zombie movie meets the fog, that would be really cool. And I went, do you know what, mate? The, the, the market's way too oversaturated. I would never get to do a zombie movie. Two years later, I'm like, fuck, I need to come up with a zombie movie. <laughs> um, like, it was just a case of, like, I, I get to then um, play with, with body movement and things like that, and one of the things I always wanted to do was, like, find and get them all to find, like, limbs to lead with and things, and we wanted to put, like, a bit of yellow through the, the skin tone, so it kind of felt like that kind of jaundice, because we, the whole point of the film was always making sure we kept colour throughout it, and it was bright and breezy, and still, even when it got dark, there was still all those colours popping through. It was screaming like dark Christmas. So, yeah, we, we can see you're, you're a massive fan of horror films. Were you a fan of musicals before this? If, or genuinely, if you did, if you did come and say, go and go see a musical, you need to drag me kicking and screaming. Like, like my favourite musical was South Park, I got longer run the car. <laughs> Why is that? It's a Broadway uh, It's a Broadway musical. Um, uh, but since then, like, I, like, I had to, um, when I pitched for the film, I was going, oh God, I need no musicals. Um, so I watched like loads, what, I went bought loads on DVD, I went to go see Wicked Life, and if nobody's seen Legally Blonde, the musical, you have to go see it. It's <laughs> hilarious, absolutely hilarious. Um, and like, I fell in love with things like West Side Story, I've never seen West Side Story before, and I just love the cinematography and the cutting and things like that, and I started to realise that, you know, it's, it's not just people singing, you know, it's, you know there's a, the whole story here and there's different ways of telling that story. So, you know, I really, really embraced that kind of side of it and wanted to watch as much as possible and sort of see as much as possible. I get told to watch High School the Musical, I bailed after 10 minutes. <laughs> like, I just couldn't stick it. And um, Glee, I had to watch the first season of Glee and even before I watched it, I bailed on that as well. And that was as much as musicals as I got. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the development of the film because uh, the film was originally developed from a short film by Ryan McHenry uh, called Zombie Musical, which the, the script was based on, he was writing it, and, and uh, but he sadly died before all of them was in development. So, how difficult was it for you kind of coming onto a project that was obviously sort of a, a labour of love for somebody else, and then trying to sort of honour what he'd made, but also make it your own? Was that, you know, how, how did you find that process? So, I, 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 I don't know if you guys know, so this film was based on a short, um, it was a, two, a 2012 short, it was a, a BAFTA, um, uh, new Talent, a one woman in sh uh, short, called Zombie Musical, and it was written and directed by Ryan McHenry. Ryan seen High School the Musical and thought, man, this would be amazing if zombies turned up in the exact air front. <laughs> and decided that, you know, like, he was going to do the short, and the, the short did, did well, and they go in and in development. And unfortunately, um, Ryan passed away um, with uh, osphorus sarcosis, which is a type of bone cancer, so he, he passed away at 27. Um, my lead producer was his like long term, uh, long term childhood friend. They grew up together and stuff. And he, you know, had asked him before he passed, do you want us to carry on with the project? And he did because you know my composers were on board, Tommy Riley and Roddy Hart, and you know the production got to a, a point. And you know Alan McDonald, the co-writer, was on board. And um, when uh, they were looking for a new director, you know, I came on board and it was scary, it was, because, you know, these guys had also been working together forever and they were all best pals and stuff, and, but, like, when you go to work with a team like Blaze and Griffin, it's honestly, it's like going home, you're working with a family, it's like a, it's a real love and a real support, um, and they never um, shied away from anything with me, they just supported me, they wanted to see my vision coming through this. Because that's the point, I can't, I can't tell anybody else's story, I can only tell mine and I can only tell it my way. And these guys were amazing, amazing to, like, when I came on board to, to support me and encourage me. And, because they just wanted this movie to get made, you know, they loved this idea and they've been working on it for since so long, 2012, you know. Uh, you've got a fantastic young cast in the film, I mean the other guys are good as well, but <laughs> a uh, fantastic young cast. How uh, tricky was it to find people who, who 
How, how was the casting process? Were you looking for actors first, or were you looking for kind of triple threat actor, dancer, music, singer? Yeah, what, what was your kind of thing going into it? What were you looking for in, in that cast? But they both had to act and sing. It was it was it was paramount. It's all the voices are on on, on this. They, they sing on everything, um, you know. And um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we they had both. They had to have the musical chops as well as the acting chops. Um, and we found everybody relatively quickly. You know, when I came on board, there was like three hundred casting tapes to go through. It was nuts. Um, and we went down to London, and we were down here in uh, down London, and we we worked out um, with them, and we brought them on. And the only person we couldn't find is Malcolm, who played John. Like he was the only person we just couldn't find. I think we found him two weeks before production started up. Um, he was the only one. As I said, I just just wasn't right and we just had to find them. Uh, Ella Hunt, you know, who plays Anna, and we found her and we were just like, oh, wow. You know, she was magnificent right from our, our casting tapes, right through all the audition stages. Um, and, you know, the rest of them were all, I think we all found them all that same weekend. We were there, we knew who we wanted. And when you're making something like this, that, that it's on, like, a couple of levels removed from reality in terms of like it's a horror film and it's a musical, which is obviously sort of artificial. How do you keep it grounded? How do you how do you talk to the actors about keeping it grounded and keeping it kind of real? Because that realness is key to making it work as a film. I mean, so since we were sure that it was a sequence, so it was always about going in and talking about where we came from, where we're going to, you know. And it was, you know, one of the things about this cast is it was amazing was they all loved each other, like genuinely loved each other. I've never seen a bunch of people like just attach themselves to each other so much. And even Nick who plays Ben, they like they all loved him. Um, he like they they were just brilliant at like um at, at just being together if you know what I mean. Um, they were almost like kids back at school again when we were all shooting in the school you know, they just the the energy that they used to bring to set and they're talking about we're shooting in Scotland in February the rain's coming in sideways, the wind's come blowing in, it's freezing cold, and all the time they would just bring that energy. And it was a case of just like making sure like they, they knew who, you know, the, the script was wonderful. And, you know, Alan McDonald had done a wonderful, wonderful job taking it forward and working towards that. And, and then sort of finding those places. I mean, I think we had two weeks of rehearsals before we went in to shoot it. Um, and, as I said, it was just a case of just talking. And I'm a very, very collaborative director. One of my favourite things to do with these guys was we would get to, um, uh, we'd shoot take one, two, and three. And when it got to take three and take four, I would say to them, do what you want, do whatever you want. Because they, I knew that they, they thrived on this, this opportunity to just go and show off and just go and do something that they'd been thinking about and they wanted to try out. The, they made every single time they came in, they hit their marks, they delivered their lines, and they did everything that I needed them to do so that they could go off and go try out things. Um, Paul, Paul Kay is great as the, the villain of the film. Was he somebody who was, you always had in mind for the part, or was he something you discovered through the casting process? It, it was something that um, they suggested. They were like, you know, what about Paul Kay? And I went, Dennis Penis. <laughs> Actually, that's a good shout. And we, and when we were speaking to Paul, um, he, he called me up one night, um, and we sat and had a chat about it. And it was, like, it was another way of me being able to say, Paul, like, look, I want you to come in and throw yourself into this, and you know, I want you to get your stamp all over Savage. And to be fair to him, like that whole outfit, that look, everything else was what he created. He came in with my makeup team, um, my costume team, and he says, I want, I want to try this, I want to try that. He had a, this stick. And um, a stick insect teacher that he talked about, it was just this gangly guy he hated at school and he wanted to recreate him. And Paul was brilliant, genuinely brilliant. Whenever we were turning around, you know, to go and do something else, he was still on set, he was pacing, he was thinking, he was always sort of had ideas. Um, and it's great to work with someone like Paul because he really, really did throw himself right into this role. Um, you've got some fantastic songs in the film, which I guess are now embedded in your head for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, how much input did you, as a director, have into into the songs and in, in terms of? Because obviously you've got to make them work within within the film as a whole. So were they finished when you came to it, or did you have input? How did that work? So I think there was six songs when I started, and I think like three of them stayed, three or four of them stayed, and the rest all, all were all changed. And we talked them about them as a group, you know, like me. Um, my 
two composers, the writer and the, the, the two producers, we were in it all the time. I set up something which was called Friday Music Club, where every Friday afternoon when we were suddenly finishing up for work, we would all go in and <coughs> sit down and we'd, we'd just talk about you know, each scene and we'd talk about musical inspirations and things like that, where we would just be able just to just talk about things and talk about music and where we were going and all, like the scenes all had ideas and the boys themselves like, my composers are amazing. They are two singer-songwriters from Glasgow. They've never done a musical before. They've never scored a film before. And they themselves were just, like, so excited about it. And, ev like, every day they were in working on stuff and sharing stuff and sending stuff. And it was always an open dialogue. But it was always about, like, we never just wanted to break any a song because we were like, ah, oh, it's been 15 minutes, let's wrap a tune in there. You know, he, he didn't want to do that. It was always about, you know, progress the story, progress the characters, and they had to do that. So, we, as I say, we just had constant dialogue about everything. Um, I, I think there was the only one song that I had any influence on was the fish rap. Like, <laughs> really. What happened was, um, I was sitting there, we had this like weird tune that had sort of played over them just to get, to get them moving. And then um, we were in post, and I went, oh, I'm going to... And it was great, it was in post-production. Like, my edit suite was here, and down, down the corridor was the music room where the boys were working. And I went in here, Roddy, one of my composers, and I went, right, I love fish rap. <laughs> you know, like, I like big fish and I cannot lie. Something like that, right? And my other composer, Tommy, wasn't there. And Tommy always says, like, this day, I thought Roddy went mental. Like, he come, he come in at like 9 o'clock the next day, and Roddy was sitting there, and he went, he spun in his seat, and he went, right, my favourite dish is fish, mother flipper, and I hate it for that. <laughs> And Tommy was like, I genuinely thought he went mental. <laughs> he just started rapping about fish at me, and I just didn't know what was going on. Um, <laughs> so I was like the only real one I could have to say that. But I mean, we, we, as I say, we talked about all the instrumentation and the music and what, what kind of feel we wanted from everything. Um, another element of the film that's very strong is Christmas. And what is it about Christmas and horror that goes to together so well because there's, there's, there's a, I think we've seen like three or four when we were like programming the festival, three or four Christmas horror films. So so was that always a part of the thing? Was that something you brought to it? And, and what is it about Christmas and horror that goes together so well? Like that that was a, that was a, uh, an early, early stage thing that the, the, the Ryan and, and Alan had put in the script. You know, at first it was a, you know, like a, a zombie high school thing and saying saying at Christmas and like for me I love that because that gives me the opportunity to play with all this colour and I love colour. So it's my, my, my DOP, she's just colour mad. So turning around to me every now and then going, do you like the blue or do you like the green? <laughs> Both. Um, so uh, like uh, the, the, the Christmas element for me anyway personally is my mum starts doing Christmas stuff in October. Like so like for years and then I used to, she used to drop me off at school and she'd drive with the window down playing Christmas tunes going, love you! And you'd be like, please stop, please stop. It's October. Um, so, like, for me, I get to set fire to Christmas trees, I get to kill Santa Claus, I get to lock off Frosty Snowman's head, so it's like a real release. Um, but I mean, like, when, when, when Christmas we got the opportunity, as I say, play with that, like, real, um, all that colour, and that happy time of year that we're all supposed to be kind of coming together and sort of, like, looking forward to the holidays and looking forward to that time, and then you're like, I Merry Christmas, Anna, cheers, I'm dying. Um, you know, like with that, taking that dark tongue, it's like, I don't know, I, I find it a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, so for that, Christmas, brilliant. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience. If anybody's uh, got a question, just put your hand up and we'll come to you with a microphone. Is there anybody out there? I can't. I don't pay, unless you ask me to. <laughs> yeah, just one in the middle. Yeah, wait, thank you. Are we going to find out what happens to them next? No. <laughs> <laughs> So we've been asked about like an Anna sequel. There's a few times that people said like, you know, we we'll used to do a sequel. We're like, no, 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 no sequels. Um, but the idea of like, like we would love to go and work again together. And we talked about maybe doing like a mad sci-fi thing. Where it's just the spitball and I'll tell you guys, right? We talked about maybe doing this mad sci-fi thing about a band and on Earth that's absolutely terrible but they're amazing on the other side of the galaxy and you can that and transport it across. we just love to all work together again. We would really, really love to do that. Um, but we won't be doing an Anna sequel. Maybe a TV series and maybe a... Well, 
Broadway musical. <laughs> you wouldn't turn it down, would you, a Broadway musical based on that? Oh, I would, because I wouldn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you wouldn't have to do anything, you'd just take a ride. Oh, yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah, check me your check. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else with a question? So, on a somewhat related note, how far did you get through Buffy the musical episode? <laughs> right, so my writer, the writer Alan McDonald, loves Buffy, adores Buffy, and like I, when like once more with feeling comes up every now and then he goes yes, and I'm like dude, it's Buffy, like come on, uh, but like yeah yeah, it's honestly it's a, a big influence to him. He's like such a such a mad mad fan of that. So yes, we'll say it's a big influence. <laughs> Anybody else? No. Um. After the first lot of zombies, there was a song about it was like, um, coding and binary, when am I going to hear a real name, the yeah. voice, what, you was talking, you was talking about the internet there, yeah. but it was the first, pop, the first zombie outbreak, <laughs> what's that thing, in internet, first thing? So I mean like we do live in like this stage, like I don't know if you go any places, but I, I, when I go to a restaurant, I, like you see kids and stuff like that, they're all on their phones and they're all on their tablets and it's a generational thing. Um, you know, it's in that idea that you know we are so connected, the moment that you do lose it, you know, how how actual like when when you lose that connection, you know. Are we zombies? Are we zombies now? Well, we could be going Georgia Romero then I we are. Uh, I, mean, I mean, like, well, we are sheep, and like, I, you can honestly go and watch people walk down the street, they don't care where they're going, they don't know what they're doing, they're too busy in their phone. Um, and there is those connotations between that. I mean, human voice is we're supposed to take us to that real down moment that we really needed to get to in the story and in the script, where, you know, that we actually introduce real drama into the film. And I have to do that, and that's what I'm meant to, play, to get. As to, to actually that we care, as I say, at the end. So by creating that drama and that song, being able to sort of show off what our generation is, and our generation is on their phones, and you're right, or I don't know if you are right, but we are zombies looking at these things just getting across the way. That when these are gone, like how are you supposed to, how are you going to connect? And it's, it's through that conversation that's been with people when these kids, like what I really, really wanted to, to show you is it's just like through all the fun and silliness. It's just four kids in a bowling alley eating sweets, wanting to, to know that their, their mums and dads are okay, or their girlfriends are okay. Like, you know, that's what that real down moment is supposed to sort of represent and sort of be. Um, and I'm hoping that that's what comes across because then we can come back into some bit of fun. And, and then and when we get to the third act, we get to have that real drama again. Um, so and that's what that's supposed to represent. And I think that that song was originally written for Nat Natalie and really. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and we kept it! <laughs> oh yeah, anybody else? Did, was there a question down here? What, what, what over here? What uh, uh, that's the second time I've seen it. I absolutely adore it. Um, either I was really drunk at Pride Fest, or is there a song being cut from it? Ooh. Which version did you see? Did you see which side are you on? Well, when were they all argue? That's um, the one, yeah. Uh, so, Welcome to the world of distribution, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the world of cinema releases. The American version of this is even shorter. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we had to make some cuts. And then, and then uh, we um, so we put the festival version out, which was the version that we'd which cut together, we made and put out. And then we got to, we went out to Fantastic Fest in Sitges, made a little hiatus, with, and the, the, the film got bought at, um, in December by uh, Ryan Pictures and MGM and they wanted to make a couple of changes like because they're American they want a happier ending and they want less character and they want to get through your story as quick as possible so when we had the opportunity with that we were things that we were going right what can we do to pick this up and where is it that the film seems to be lagging and there was a couple of little lags in the second act that were really sort of holding us up and I'm, by the way I'm being very honest and um, what's, what we did was we were like, right, where can we tighten this up and where can we tweak it and where can we fix it? And one of the places we felt was lagging was in that second act. So <coughs> losing which side are you on helped us sort of get through that. And for you that haven't seen that, it's like um, uh, Anna's dad and uh, um, uh, Savage 
have an argument about going out, he wants to go out and find his daughter, he wants to keep the doors closed, and they have this sort of dance off and sing off. Um, and it was just one of those ones that was the easiest to sort of lose because of the, the story purposes of it. The kids were the main focus, so we'd push on with those. Um, so, yes, there will be an extended cut um, once it goes to DVD and things like that. But even in the UK, mate, like it's, it's one of these things where, like, like cinema's dying. This is why I'm thanking you guys at the start of this, because cinema's dying. It's one of these art forms that like people don't go and see because we've got Netflix and we've got Amazon and you know you wait for things to come to DVD, you know, you watch it in your home entertainment system. Um, and thus like I get dictated to how long my film can be. My film can only be X amount because they're gonna, if it's not X amount, then they're not gonna put it on as many screens. So thus it's not gonna get seen as many by many people, it's not gonna get pushed as much by as many cinemas because it doesn't sit into their time frame. It's a weird thing. And this is again why I thank you and I really, really genuinely mean it. You guys are the real champions of cinema. Um, it's, it's just something that happens. Okay, just uh, I think one or two questions more and then we'll wrap it up. So just down here first. <coughs> Hi, um, Hi, loved it. Just wanted to know where do we get the soundtrack from? Oh, so um, Hollywood Endings just been released. Um, I think that's on like um, iTunes and Apple Music and things like that. Um, they're doing they're doing a mad um, vinyl release as well for it. The Americans, the Americans are going mental for this. They're like throwing all the merchandise about. Um, but the, we're hoping to release an art track again towards Christmas. And then at the end of the, the end of the year, the full soundtrack should be should be available. Thanks very much, though. I'll tell the boys. Are there any plans for like sing along screenings? The, well, I, like well, we'll still wait to hear what's happening with like the UK release in America. They're doing like uh, midnight screenings that you can go and get like tanked up at and sing along with a bounce and ball and stuff like that. So uh, I hope, fingers crossed, that this with the UK are going to do as well. Great. Is there one last question from anyone? Any hands up? No. No. No, they don't like me. I'll second me and my movie and I'll get that. I just wanted to ask, what's, what's next for you? Because obviously it's been a massive success. You, you've been travelling around the world with it and it's, uh, yeah, I'd love to know what you're doing next. Okay, we've got a couple of things in development at Blaze and Griffin, but um, I'm just kind of like, um, I couldn't get an agent for a lot of my money before this film. Um, and all of a sudden, I've got two amazing agents at Paradigm, and like uh, I'm getting scripts from like Lionsgate and MGM and Phantom Four and stuff like that. Um, uh, Warner Brothers, it's been really, really cool. In fact, I'm reading a Disney script right now. Um, it's so I'm, I, it's really important for me to say no at the moment. It's just kind of like wait and see with that right film for that right script because I don't want to just go out and do any old crap. And then I'll just be like, oh, there's another guy that might make something and then done nothing afterwards. So I'm just kind of like looking forward to sort of seeing what happens next. Because as well as that, like all our lives have went a bit nuts. We were at Com I I'm just back at Comic Con in, in New York. Like we were in a panel at New York Comic Con. The cast were singing in a festival in Central Park. We were in the New York Times and Variety magazine and like total film are writing about us and stuff like that. Like our, our lives have went all a bit mental. So it's just I'm, I'm really just enjoying this ride. Looking forward to January where I can chill out a wee bit and do a couple of scripts. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, have a good Christmas. I hope it's uh, zombie free. And uh, let's say thanks for bringing us the film. It's a fantastic film. All the best with it. And uh, thank you very much, John McFay. <laughs>